Okay, what's up, Internet? Since Media here. I'm in the garden, so uh, there's planes flying from the airport not far from here every few minutes. So I may get interrupted by those kind of rumbling engine sounds. And as you can see, I've set up a little webcam. Not a very good webcam, I'm afraid. Which I'm using because I need to show you this. This is the BBC Microbit. It was a board created by the BBC and other educational establishments to give to kids at schools, back when kids were still going to school. And it's a nice kind of Arduino-like thing. I mean, it's very cheap. It's about... These were about less than 10 quid each, about 8 quid each. I think the new ones are about 13 quid. Um, they're not as powerful even as, like, old Arduinos in terms of memory, but they've got quite a fast ARM processor in them. And the nice thing is that they come with a whole lot of sensors and they're kind of all-in-one kit. You've got this LED late, uh, LED matrix, you've got these buttons, and you've got this accelerometers and other things in them. So, nice thing you can get hold of. Um, what I'm going to show you in these videos is like the quick and dirty way to turn them into a MIDI controller. Here I am in FL Studio. I've got a simple synth set up. I've got a beat set up, and I've got the accelerometer of this board set up to control this chorus and blur parameters so you can see when I tilt it up the blur goes up and down when I tilt it left and right the chorus is doing that so here's how it sounds <laughs> I'm afraid I'm not very good at controlling it when I've just got one hand. Perhaps I'll just do it with two hands. What's actually happening is I have. So what's happening actually happening there? I've got a program on the micro bit that's taking the data of the accelerometer, sending it up this cable, the cable here to the computer. It's going into a processing sketch, which is kind of free software for artists and hackers which is what you're seeing here. It's just capturing it and moving those positions, uh, defining the position of this little white ball in the, the screen you see here. And then that, in turn, is also turning that into MIDI control signals, and it's sending them across to FL Studio, which I've now got mapped onto them. So that's what's going on here. You can see how the position of this ball is dependent on the position of me manoeuvring this thing. Now I'm using two hands, it's much better. And we're gonna show you, I'm gonna we're gonna talk about it. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm going to show you all the code to make this work. So there's no hardware here. I'm not I mean the hardware is this, right? This is off the shelf. There's nothing more than standard micro bit and the the cable.
everything is in software. So there's some Python code running in the micro bit. There's some processing code running as this separate application. And it's just going straight into FL Studio. And I'm using this Flex synth because that's a kind of synth that was created to kind of give you these simple to change parameters. Obviously with just two dimensions of movement, there's only two of those parameters we can change. But it gives you some expression, right? It gives you a bit of expression, a bit of physicality. When you're making your music. Okay, so we are back. This is how you get your new micro bit. Uh, it comes in, or at least back <laughs> when I got these. I got a load of these about four or five years ago because uh, I thought they were really cool. And I haven't used them quite as much as I thought I would, but I can use them for this, but I still have some old ones. So here it is in this packet, unopened. We are going to open it now. Right. Here we go. And I can't see the camera, so I'm hoping the camera is showing you this. So here we go. You've got two sides to it. You've got this side that's got the controls, the two buttons, the left and right button, and this 5x5 five five matrix of stuff. You've got pins coming in and out. The other side, you've got a reset button. You've got this USB. And we are just going to plug it straight into the computer. And I think by default, okay, so you see several things on the what's popped up. This is the kind of welcome message. And on my screen, you'll see that uh, it pops up as this, as a drive. And it's telling me, so this is the kind of startup message of the micro bit. It's telling you to press that button. Now it says press the B button. I'm going to press the B button. This is just like a kind of standard startup program. Shake. Let's shake you. I'd forgotten it does this. <laughs> All right. I'm shaking you. Yeah. All right. Now it's become a dice. Chase the dot. I hope you're seeing that. There you go. Anyway, we're not going to play the game now. What we're going to do first is... So here is the online Python development environment, okay? Pythonmicrobit.org version 2 slash v2. Okay, so here we are in the pythonmicrobit.org by default, it gives you this hello world. So I will do what I always do. I will change that to say hello, teenage America. And what do we do here? Well, we've got the micro bit plugged in. We've got these controls here. So this is a tiny Python program. It's doing basically this. It's saying from the micro bit library, import everything. That's where all of these objects that represent the capabilities of the micro bit are and then it says while true so in other words that's just like an infinite loop it's a loop going on forever we're going to display scrolling the message hello teenage america and then we're going to show the image heart which is the little sort of icon heart and we're going to sleep for two seconds two thousand milliseconds so i download that and it seems from this website it's going to download a program called the hex now that's the compiled version of the program and if you remember the micro bit pops up as a kind of drive so if you just say i'm going to save that and you're going to save it it's popped up here as the drive g so i'm just going to save it directly into drive g and you'll see that this yellow light flashes for a bit And now the message, hello, teenage 
America is scrolling past and the little heart icon and now it does it again so as you can see we have a development environment and then this pops up again uh, that's where we're going to write our code and that's really all there is to this so far so let's close that now and let's go to my code which is the simple code to use accelerometer here is that code and you can see it's very short we are importing everything from the microbit library again now one of the things that we get to import is this thing called the UART now that is the serial connection under this USB cable and we need to set that up with a known board rate so what's a board rate? A board rate is the speed at which we are sending data from this board back to the computer in order for the computer and the board to talk to each other they have to it's a serial cable so they're sending a sequence of pulses from the, from the board to the computer in order to enable that communication to work they must both be expecting to speak at the same frequency of pulses otherwise when one sends you know the cha the train of pulses up and down uh, the other one is kind of sampling it at the wrong rate so that's what the board rate is and we're setting it to this 115200 standard now we go into this while loop again I'm assuming you've probably seen some Python before if you haven't seen Python before I'm not going to teach it here but it's you can find tutorials everywhere it's a very simple easy language to learn one of the great things about it is it's more or less there's not a lot of kind of syntax to learn it just kind of does seems obvious uh, the important thing to note about Python is that the block structure is actually defined by these indents so when you see something like while true that defines a loop and then everything that is indented underneath it is inside that loop so here's what we do we clear the display again the display object which represents that little screen came in with the was imported here we set the X Y and Z the accelerometer object also came in that's got a function called get values that returns the X Y and the Z values as a tuple in other words a kind of not just one number but three numbers together so we assign that to the X Y and Z variables here we then set the pixel now the the pixels here are numbered 0 to 4 across and 0 to 4 down so we set pixel 2 2 which is that middle pixel if you think about it it's 0 1 2 across 0 1 2 down and we set it to intensity 4 which is about midway we then say okay now the values that these accelerometers values come in are between minus 1024 and plus 1024 so we'll assume then that a minus 300 or anything less than minus 300 is is a definitive tilt to the left anything more than 300 is a definitive tilt to the right so here we're just going to show some light up some pixels for that and if it's less than minus 300 we're going to display the pixel on the the left the zero column second down second row down intensity nine so that just sets the kind of the westernmost pixel similarly if it's a definitive tilt to the right we'll set the the easternmost pixel to the north sorry to the 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 y which is this will send the set the northern pixel and it's up then there's this line here which I will explain in a second this, this is the line that's now packaging the data up as a string and sending it off up the cable it's the UART again which is the object that represents this connection and this is what Python does if you want to create a formatted string you create a string with these percent S's a uh, couple of 
line breaks at the end and then you just use this operator called percent which basically is an operator that says on the left hand side it's a string with a format with some slots to fill with data and on the right hand side of this percent operator you have again a tuple in other words a list of numbers which will be used to fill those slots so I'm filling this 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 string contains five slots separated by commas and over here I'm filling those five slots with the X and the Y and the Z that we set got from the accelerometer plus there are these two objects button A and button B which represent the two buttons we're not using them yet but I'll show you them in a second um, and we are setting we're, we're just calling the is pressed test which will be true for when it's down and false when it's up and so we are sending in this string all three X Y and Z uh, coordinates of the accelerometer not using the Z it's slightly <laughs> awkward to actually get useful to, to control it although I'm sure it, it can be it can be used fine um, but anyway we're just getting all the data we might possibly use at this point bundling it into that string sending it up the cable and then down here is the sleep which just waits for 30 milliseconds so so make sure we're not trying to send the data up too fast and that's it you know really really simple on the board just grab the data blast it up the cable we're going to download this onto the board now so I'm going to hit the down the download thing it's compiled it put it into the save it save it to the board and now you should see the board waiting it's installing it and now you'll see just this pixel here in the middle at a low intensity to show it's there and now you'll see if we tilt to the left we tilt to the right tilt forward it's hard to see all this camera I'm afraid sorry uh, I'm not even seeing what's on the camera so I hope this is is visible in fact let me just check that oh and this pops up again Good. tilt tilt to the left tilt to the right if you can see that tilt forwards backwards yeah so just to show you you know we could add something extra to this let's let's just do something when the buttons are clicked uh, I had this code prepared earlier so now I've just added this extra code for the buttons here so the button A is pressed I'm gonna uh, display the pixel in the top left hand corner 00, zero intensity 9 button B is pressed I'm going to do the pixel in the top right hand corner let's just download that and put that in And you'll now see that when oh, that goes away, you'll now see that when I click the left button, that lights up, and when I click the right button, that lights up. So we've got the buttons as well. So you'd think this part is dumb. Unfortunately, this is a new or an old micro bit. For this to work fully, it might need a firmware update. So you need to go to this page here microbit get started user guide firmware and follow these instructions for updating the firmware so I'm going to do this but I may cut it out of the video if it seems boring this is a microbit version 1 so I'm just going to download that save that to the microbit no <laughs> I missed I did it wrongly what I've got to do is I've got to unplug that 
and I've got to plug it in holding this button, the reset button down. So I'm going to do that. And now you'll see on the screen it's open in maintenance mode. So now I will come here, I will download the firmware for version 1. I will put that into this maintenance directory and hopefully when that's installed itself I mean it's quite a clever system this to be honest it's reopened itself now in this format is that sufficient let's now reinstall this into the normal place and now we're going to look at my code here and let's see all right and that's working now that might not have worked <laughs> that's working it might not have worked if we hadn't set the thing right so it's time to look at this processing sketch Processing is a system for artists. You go to this site, processing.org, you download it here, and it's a Java system. I'm not a big Java fan, but processing is a very good language, and I'm not going to explain how to install it today. I may, if there's any demand, and demand leave a leave a comment, if there is, do a couple of tutorials on getting started with processing, even though, even for the kind of basic non-musical stuff, because it's worth learning. Uh, but I'm just going to assume you've kind of, you can, you can figure that out for yourself and just going to talk about the, the music related stuff here. Let's have a look at the processing sketch that I wrote. Here we go. Uh, there are a couple of imports again look, remember this is Java it's not Python it's slightly different syntax but same principle we've got some libraries and there are two libraries we want uh, one of them is the processing serial that's the the library that's going to let us pull in data from the serial cable and the other is the MIDI bus now in order to that's a standard that's a library from processing but you'd have to install it by going to the tools uh, going to this libraries thing here and it's called you just here you go you you search for MIDI there and the MIDI bus library already installed here but if it isn't you'll have to install that so when you've done that that and that's that automatically installs itself serial port Serial is for the, is for getting the thing up the cable. MIDI bus is for then sending the MIDI data out onto other software on our machine. Every processing uh, we call these processing sketches, these small programs that we write in processing, and every one of them processing has this environment. We do the whole work in this environment. Every processing sketch has kind of two parts to it. It has a setup which runs once when the program is run. And then it has a draw which is run continuously. So that's like the infinite loop. You don't have to write a loop to go running around. It just keeps looping itself around doing this draw. Obviously, we've got two objects here. We have to, in Java, we have to kind of declare all the objects in advance. So we're going to declare an object called serial port that represents the way that we're going to get the data from. And it's of type serial that came in from this processing with this library here when we imported this library we got this object this class serial similarly when we imported the MIDI bus we got <laughs> we got the object the class MIDI bus so we're now going to declare instances of those objects for ourselves the serial port object and the MIDI bus object now in our setup this size just defines the size of the window we're going to use here we're setting up the serial connection so serial class here has got a 
method called list that just prints the list of all the available serial connections. This is really just useful for debugging in case we can't find it. Then if the length of that list is greater than zero, then it means there is at least a, a serial, something plugged into the serial, which obviously is our micro bit. We create a new instance of a serial port that represents the ports to that object with the new serial. This is just a default parameter for saying it's the sketch that owns this thing. It's going to be the first item. We just assume at this point there's no other serial devices plugged in. And again, it's that baud rate of 115200. That's the crucial thing here. We're saying create a port connected from this sketch on that default first serial device it's connected and it's talking at this speed. If for some reason that list had a length of zero, we couldn't find it. So we just print, you know, we couldn't find serial and we exit. So by the end of this bit of code here, we now have our serial object, serial port object connected to the micro bit, hopefully. Now we set up the MIDI bus. Um, again, there's a kind of list for, for doing this. That's really for debugging. This works slightly differently in Windows and Linux because we have to tell it what MIDI device in your operating system you are looking for. Now, I've mentioned before, I'm using this loop B, which is a sort of standard MIDI bus device within Windows. So I've got to tell MIDI bus to talk to that. Again, I connect, I, the, this just tells it that the MIDI bus is, is from this application. The minus one, I'm just saying we're not bringing in any, there's no input. We're not listening to MIDI on any device. And then we are giving it an output device. So we do want to be sending MIDI to. And what do we want to be sending MIDI to? Well, the thing who has this label loop B internal MIDI. Right, you'll get this code. I will put links to this in the description so you don't have to kind of remember this stuff. But so you understand what's going on here and you might need to debug this. If you're not using loop B and you're using something else, you might need to give it a different name. If you're in Linux, in my Linux setup, I use this thing called Jervil, which serves the same purpose. Although, to be honest, I have problems using MIDI in, in Linux. The Java default MIDI library is not, if I remember, doesn't work <laughs> so well. Uh, I can't quite remember what, what the issues were there, but you know, it, it, this stuff works fine in Windows for me. And that's where I'm obviously running FL Studio. So theoretically, we could do something similar in Linux. In practice, it's more problematic. Now, I'm just defining a convenience function for myself here called send control. You don't really need that, but if your MIDI messages were going to be more complicated, you might want to do something else. Here, we're just going to send controller data out. And controller data is like for knobs and sliders and things. And obviously it's continuous numbers. Like all MIDI messages, it comes out on a channel. So we're going to take in the arguments channel number, the actual number of the parameter we want. Uh, I should have called it something more sensible like parameter, I suppose. Maybe I'll do that. Uh, I'll call that param. And then the actual value. So if it's like a knob, all MIDI standard all the values are always between 0 and 1 127 so in fact what does this function send control do well it calls the midi bus uh, to the midi bus it sends controller change message to the midi bus with those values and that's now going to go out to the rest of the world let's now get into our draw function now our draw function is the thing that just continuously loops around so when we run this uh, it's the thing that is drawing this on the screen and it's also sending the MIDI out. So as you can see what it does is as we move this control the controller it just moves this white dot around. Now it does that in a slightly more sophisticated way. I'm going to model a kind of position of that white dot with these variables x and y. So I'm just setting them up outside the draw function. 
they have to be declared outside of the draw because they're not local to the draw. They're going to remember the position of that dot between one call. You know, each time around the loop, we call this draw function again. So we need to anything that persists beyond one execution of the draw function needs to be declared in a scope outside it. So that's where the X and Y are being declared. Right, in the draw function, we do background zero. That just sets the background to be black. You know, we could do it the other way around. We could set the background to be white and we could fill it with black. And now we would get a kind of uh, black circle on a white background. So that's just setting up our back, clearing our background of our screen and setting up our color. Now, we set up now some local variables here. These are the input X, input Y, input Z. And why this is slightly more complicated than you might think, I'm modeling the position of that dot with X. This is really about smoothing it out. The data that's coming in from here is quite noisy. You know, sometimes, to give you a bad value, sometimes the data coming up from here, the communication with the serial doesn't get parsed correctly and you'll get an error. And so, the numbers coming directly up are very, very noisy, and you need to smooth that out. So in order to smooth that out, what I'm doing is when I'm taking the numbers that are coming in from here, I'm using those, to, I'm modeling the position of, the, of that dot with the X and Y, and I'm simply adding these values DX and DY to it each time around. So if there's a tilt to the left, then the value dx is going to be a negative number. If there's a, a, a tilt to the right, the value of dx is going to be a positive number. And then I'm going to add that chain, that dx, that change, to the absolute value x each time around. So rather than taking the absolute position of this, I'm kind of taking it as an indicator of which direction to be pushing the dot at this point. And then I'm setting up some variables called A and B to represent a button, even though we're not using them at the moment. So now we have to wrap this in a test for whether the serial port is not null. Because if we failed to create a serial port, well, in fact, it should never be null at this point. But we might have been running a more complicated program where we wanted it to continue running even if the serial port didn't get created because I mean, I've got code like that. However, making sure the serial port exists and is available. Now we are going to create a string called serial buffer, and that's just reading the string from the serial port. So in other words, that string that we printed, we wrote at this point that packs up the five items of data, that string is getting read into this thing called serial buffer. Right, make sure it's not null again, and we're going to wrap this in a try. A try is just a way of kind of saying, run some code. If there's an error or an exception, something went wrong, don't crash the program. We'll just handle it in this catch thing that's down here, which is the exception handler. In this kind of code, you need it to be robust when you know, you're talking to the outside world, all kind of weird things can happen because the outside world corruption on the on this serial port, etc. So you don't want your program to crash the moment something weird happens, weird data comes in. So we kind of wrap it up in all these extra layers of protection. Again, this is not something you need to learn, but it's helpful to, and you sort of need to know why it's doing all this when you're reading this code and when you come to adapt it for yourself. So the first thing I do is I just trim it. I take the buffer and I trim it. That trims off the carriage returns, etc. Uh, any spaces or things. Uh, and I print it out. It, it, the printing, this is again for debugging. You can see down here the results of printing it out. So for example, an example when uh, something got corrupted and it tried it thought that false was a number it printed out that message but it didn't crash but a typical example is this that string comes in with say three numbers the x y the z and the the boolean values of the a and b okay so now i've got a string 
I presume I have a string that's comma separated numbers. I'm now going to create this array of strings called parts. That is the result of taking that buffer and splitting it on the comma. So that now turns that single array, single string into an, a, an array of parts. Okay. When we get now down to this, ix equals now the, the class integer. So, so the first of these three, the x, y, and z, we need to parse them, the string, to get a numeric value out. So I just say ix equals integer parse int of par parts zero. So the first element of that array, which represents this x value here, we call the standard way the integers parse that into a number. And now the ix value contains that number 304. Java is a verbose language, uh, but it does what you need. So you've got we the important the important code here is this line that reads the buffer, this line that trims the buffer, this line that splits the buffer into parts which are still strings at the comma separator, and then this line here takes that turns it into a an integer and again now we're going to say uh, now we want to set the values of our DX in other words based on what number came in here we're going to update the DX which is the kind of direction we're pushing the X coordinate in up until this point this code was really all just about the slightly verbose way of making sure we're getting the, the value from this serial cable into a number. This next bit again is part of our sort of smoothing out the very noisy data. So we're just saying here, right, if the number is less than 300 that we got in, we're going to set the value of dx to have a value less than zero, which is pushing it. Now, I wanted to make it so the more we tilt it, the faster that moves. You know, a little bit of a tilt moves it slowly. A, a, a steeper tilt moves it more. So I'm using this map function. A map function basically takes the number in a that's in a particular coordinate space and maps it into a different coordinate space. So here I'm saying take that number that's come in. We're only going to do this if there's a, a certain definitive tilt of minus 300 at least. Remember these numbers are coming in between minus 1024 and 1024. But if we got a definitive tilt to the left, then we're going to map that number in from the space that's minus 1024 plus 1024 into a space that's somewhere between minus 20 and minus 1. In other words, if it's a definitive tilt, it's going to definitely give us a number. Dx is definitely going to be a negative number. In other words, this number is going to be used to push that dot to the left. But the more tilted it is, the bigger that that push is going to be. So at the extreme, it's going to be minus 20. And at the less extreme, it's going to be minus 1. In fact, you know, it's never going to be minus 1 because I'm mapping from the whole space. But that's why this works. In fact, perhaps it would be better to do this from, from 0 at this point and similarly here. So... If it's a definitive tilt, we're going to map it somewhere between that minus 1024 and 0 to being minus 20 and minus 1. Similarly, if it's greater than that, it's a definitive tilt to the right. Same principle, but now we're going to map it. That dx value is going to be a number between 1 and 20. That's convoluted. It's not hugely important how I did that it's there because it makes this controller smoother <laughs>
This part is about interpreting the buttons. We won't bother about that at the moment. If anything went wrong, and the sort of things that can go wrong is, like I say, if the if the serial, if there was noise on the serial and the corruption, you know, something got corrupted or out of sequence, then one of those things that you're trying to parse into a number could have something that's just now some junk that isn't parsable into a number. It's going to throw an exception. So you'll get one of these kind of like number format exceptions popping up. We just want to catch those here. We just want to print that there was an exception. And here's an example. Tell us what the exception was. And, you know, the point is this is not meant to crash our program. We just got to be able to kind of, you know, we're reporting it just for kind of diagnostic purposes. In fact, we don't, you know, once the code is running, you probably don't want to even do that. But just to show what's going on. But what we want to make sure is that this does not crash our program fully. So we capture it and then we ignore it effectively. Now, x is x plus the dx. In other words, that value that came in based on the tilt is now being added to our absolute position for x. So when we run this, as you can see, it's kind of smoother because you know that but that dot definitely is not just maps directly to the position where it would be jumping all over the place no it's just moving in a direction according to that according to what the the dx that came up the dx is defined by that and the dx just is it and the y are just incremented by that these things here are just to stop it going off the sc the screen entirely if we get to zero we keep it at zero we clamp it at zero we don't let it go be a low zero if it's Width is a, is a variable that just represents the height, width and height, of the, so width of the screen, height is height of the screen. This is to stop us, you know, tilting and going completely off and losing the dot entirely. Right, here's the important thing. We now draw the ellipse, in other words, the ellipse is this dot, at the XY position, size 20. That's really, so we know where we are. We could draw anything at this point if we wanted, but for simplicity, I'm drawing the dot. And now that's it. That's that's our thing. So so finally, the important thing here is these send control. Right, we're sending out on channel one. You could you could have multiple MIDI devices connected, and each is listening on a different channel. And obviously, the ones that are going to receive this control, you want to be listening on the same channel. So in this case, it's one, but we can change this to anything up to 16. The parameter numbers in FL Studio, for example, we've mapped these to parameter numbers one and two. You kind of learn the parameter or attach them to the MIDI parameters coming in. And then again, we're using this map. We're taking these numbers that in our thing are mapped between zero and the width and y, sorry, the x is between zero and the width i'm inverting the y so that this direction moves up and this direction moves down so i do that by in this map saying map between height and zero rather than zero and height and then we're just mapping those onto the standard midi values of naught to two one two seven and so you will see when this is running and this moves, if we go back into FL Studio, again, as we move the dot left and right, that chorus value here goes up and down. And as we move it up and down like this, that blur value goes up and down. And Getting better at controlling this now. So that's it. Like a 13 quid MIDI controller. I mean, okay, so basic MIDI controller. You can probably pick these up pretty cheaply and easily. Uh, no hardware hacking, just free software. Processing is free software. Obviously, the, the environment for... Python programming on this is just online and we get 
the ability to add some expression to our music through this physical device. Uh, thanks very much for watching. I think that's long enough. And I will be back again. Still day job stuff to finish off. Back to the Lua VST protoplug. I've not forgotten that. I'm still working on some stuff for that. But that's coming at some point. Now I've gone, I've taken the plunge to show this. I think I've got some other work I did a couple of years ago with processing to send MIDI to FL Studio. So I will probably do a couple more videos on that as well. And have fun, play with this. And, you know, Microbit is really good. It's a really nice, really interesting device. So if you can get your hands on one, then, then it's well worth it. And I'm out.